The Witches by Roald Dahl A note about witches. In fairy tales, witches always wear silly black hats and black cloaks, and they ride on broomsticks. But this is not a fairy tale. This is about real witches. The most important thing you should know about real witches is this. Listen very carefully. Never forget what is coming next. Real witches dress in ordinary clothes and look very much like ordinary women. They live in ordinary houses and they work in ordinary jobs. That is why they are so hard to catch. A real witch hates children with a red-hot, sizzling hatred that is more sizzling and red-hot than any hatred you could possibly imagine. A real witch spends all her time plotting to get rid of the children in her particular territory. Her passion is to do away with them, one by one. It is all she thinks about the whole day long. Even if she is working as a cashier in a supermarket, or typing letters for a businessman, or driving around in a fancy car, and she could be doing any of these things. Her mind will always be plotting and scheming and churning and burning and whizzing and fizzing with murderous, bloodthirsty thoughts. Which child, she says to herself all day long, exactly which child shall I choose for my next squelching? A real witch gets the same pleasure from squelching a child as you get from eating a plateful of strawberries and thick cream. She reckons on doing away with one child a week, anything less than that, and she becomes grumpy. One child a week is 52 a year. Squish them and squiggle them and make them disappear. This is the motto of all witches. Very carefully, a victim is chosen. Then the witch stalks the wretched child like a hunter stalking a little bird in the forest. She treads softly. She moves quietly. She gets closer and closer. Then at last, when everything is ready, and she swoops. Sparks fly. Flames leap. Oil boils. Rats howl. Skin shrivels, and the child disappears. A witch, you must understand, does not knock children on the head or stick knives into them or shoot at them with a pistol. People who do those things get caught by the police. A witch never gets caught. Don't forget that she has magic in her fingers and devilry dancing in her blood. She can make stones jump about like frogs, and she can make tongues of flame go flickering across the surface of the water. These magic powers are very frightening. Luckily, there are not a great number of real witches in the world today, but there are still quite enough to make you nervous. In England, there are probably about 100 of them altogether. Some countries have more, Others have not quite so many. No country in the world is completely free from witches. A witch is always a woman. I do not wish to speak badly about women. Most women are lovely, but the fact remains that all witches are women. There is no such thing as a male witch. On the other hand, a ghoul is always a male. So indeed is a bargast. Both are dangerous, but neither of them is half as dangerous as a real witch. As far as children are concerned, a real witch is easily the most dangerous of all living creatures on earth. What makes her doubly dangerous is the fact that she doesn't look dangerous. Even when you know all the secrets, you will hear about those in a minute, you can still never quite be sure whether it is a witch you are gazing at or just a kind lady. If a tiger were able to make himself look like a large dog with a waggy tail, you would probably go up and pat him on the head. 
and that would be the end of you. It is the same with witches. They all look like nice ladies. Kindly examine the picture below. Which lady is the witch? That is a difficult question, but it is one that every child must try to answer. For all you know, a witch might be living next door to you right now. Or she might be the woman with bright eyes who sat opposite you on the bus this morning. She might be the lady with the dazzling smile who offered you a sweep from a white paper bag in the street before lunch. She might even, and this will make you jump, she might even be your lovely school teacher who is reading these words to you at this very moment. Look carefully at that teacher. Perhaps she is smiling at the absurdity of such a suggestion. Don't let that put you off. It could be part of her cleverness. I am not, of course, telling you for one second that your teacher actually is a witch. All I am saying is that she might be one. It is most unlikely, but, and here comes the big but, it is not impossible. Oh, if only there were a way of telling for sure whether a woman was a witch or not. Then we could round them up and put them in, um, in the meat grinder. Unhappily, there is no such way. But there are a number of little signals you can look out for. Little quirky habits that all witches have in common. And if you know about these, if you remember them always, then you might just possibly manage to escape from being squelched before you are very much older. My grandmother... I myself had two separate encounters with witches before I was eight years old. From the first, I escaped unharmed, but on the second occasion, I was not so lucky. Things happened to me that will probably make you scream when you read about them. That can't be helped. The truth must be told. The fact that I am still here and able to speak to you, however peculiar I may look, is due entirely to my wonderful grandmother. My grandmother was Norwegian. The Norwegians know all about witches. For Norway, it, with its black forests and icy mountains, is where the first witches came from. My father and my mother were also Norwegian. But because my father had a business in England, I had been born there, and had lived there and had started going to an English school. Twice a year, at Christmas and in summer, we went back to Norway to visit my grandmother. This old lady, as far as I could gather, was just about the only surviving relative we had on either side of our family. She was my mother's mother, and I absolutely adored her. When she and I were together, we spoke in either Norwegian or in English. It didn't matter which. We were equally fluent in both languages and I have to admit that I felt closer to her than to my mother. Soon after my seventh birthday, my parents took me, as usual, to spend t Christmas with my grandmother in Norway. And it was over there, while my father and mother and I were driving in icy weather just north of Oslo, that our car skidded off the road and went tumbling into a rocky ravine. My parents were killed. I was firmly strapped into the back seat and received only a cut on, my, on the forehead. I won't go into the horrors of that terrible afternoon. I still get the shivers when I think about it. I finished up, of course, back in my grandmother's house with her arms around me tight and both of us crying the whole night long. What are we going to do now? I asked her through the tears. You will stay here with me, she said, and I will look after you. Aren't I going back to England? No, she said. I could never do that. Heaven shall take my soul, but Norway shall keep my bones. The very next day, in order that we might both try to forget our great sadness, my grandmother started telling me stories. She was a wonderful storyteller, and I was enthralled by everything she told me. 
but I didn't become really excited until she got on to the subject of witches. She was apparently a great expert on these creatures, and she made it very clear to me that her witch stories, unlike most of the others, were not imaginary tales. They were all true. They were the gospel truth. They were history. Everything she was telling me about witches had actually happened, and I had better believe it. What was worse, what was far, far worse, was that witches were still with us. They were all around us, and I had better believe that too. Are you really being truthful, Grandmama? Really and truly truthful? (laughs) My darling, she said, you won't last long in this world if you don't know how to spot a witch when you see one. But you told me that witches were like ordinary women, Grandmama, so how can I spot them? You must listen to me, my grandmother said. You must remember everything I tell you. After that, all you can do is cross your heart and pray to heaven and hope for the best. We were in the big living room of her house in Oslo, and I was ready for bed. The curtains were never drawn in that house, and through the windows I could see huge snowflakes falling slowly onto an outside world that was as black as tar. My grandmother was tremendously old and wrinkled, with a massive wide body which was smothered in gray lace. She sat there majestic in her armchair, filling every inch of it. Not even a mouse could have squeezed into the side beside her. I myself, just seven years old, was crouched on the floor at her feet, wearing pajamas, dressing gown, and slippers. You swear you aren't pulling my leg? I kept saying to her. You swear you aren't just pretending? Listen, she said. I have known no less than five children who have simply vanished off the face of this earth, never to be seen again. The witches took them. I still think you're just trying to frighten me, I said. I'm trying to make sure you don't go the same way, she said. I love you and I want you to stay with me. Tell me about the children who disappeared, I said. My grandmother was the only grandmother I ever met who smoked cigars. She lit one now, a long black cigar that smelt of burning rubber. The first child I knew who disappeared, she said, was called Rangheld Hansen. Rangheld was about eight at the time, and she was playing with her little sister on the lawn. Their mother, who was baking bread in the kitchen, came outside for a breath of air. Where's Rangheld? she asked. She went away with the tall lady, the little sister said. What tall lady? the mother said. The tall lady in white gloves, the little sister said. She took Rangheld by the hand and led her away. No one, my grandmother said, ever saw Rangheld again. Didn't they search for her? I asked. They searched for miles around. Everyone in the town helped. But they never found her. What happened to the other four children? I asked. They vanished just as Rangel did. How, Grandmama? How did they vanish? In every case, a strange lady was seen outside the house just before it happened. But how did they vanish? I asked. The second one was very peculiar, my grandmother said. There was a family called Christensen. They lived up in Hummelkollen, and they had an old oil painting in the living room, which they were very proud of. The painting showed some ducks in the yard outside a farmhouse. There were no people in the painting, just a flock of ducks on a grassy farmyard and the farmhouse in the background. It was a large painting and rather pretty, Well, one day their daughter, Solvig, came home from school eating an apple. She said a nice lady had given it to her on the street. The next morning, little Solvig was not in her bed. The parents searched everywhere, but they couldn't find her. Then, 
All of a sudden, her father shouted, There she is! That's Solveig, feeding the ducks! He was pointing at the oil painting, and sure enough, Solveig was in it. She was standing in the farmyard in the act of throwing bread to the ducks out of a basket. Father rushed up to the painting and touched her, but that didn't help. She was simply a part of the painting, just a picture painted on the canvas. Did you ever see that painting, Grandmama? With the little girl in it? Many times, my grandmother said. And the peculiar thing was that little Solveig kept changing her position in the picture. One day she would actually be inside the farmhouse, and you could see her face looking out of the window. Another day she would be far over to the left with a duck in her arms. Did you see her moving in the picture, Grandmama? Nobody did. Wherever she was, whether outside feeding the ducks or inside looking out of the window, she was always motionless, just a figure painted in oils. It was all very odd, my grandmother said, very odd indeed. And what was most odd of all was that as the years went by, she kept growing older in the picture. In ten years, the small girl had become a young woman. In thirty years, she was middle-aged. Then all at once, fifty-four years after it all happened, she disappeared from the picture altogether. You mean she died? I said. Who knows? My grandmother said. Some very mysterious things go on in the world of witches. That's two you've told me about, I said. What happened to the third one? The third one was little Birgit Svensson, my grandmother said. She lived across the road from us. One day she started growing feathers all over her body. Within a month she had turned into a large white chicken. Her parents kept her for years in a pen in the garden. She even laid eggs. What color eggs, I said. Brown ones, my grandmother said. Biggest eggs I've ever seen in my life. Her mother made omelets out of them. Delicious they were. I gazed up at my grandmother, who sat there like some ancient queen on her throne. Her eyes were misty gray, and they seemed to be looking at something many, many miles away. The cigar was only the only real thing about her at that moment and the smoke made it, it billowed around her head in blue clouds. But the little girl who became a chicken didn't disappear, I said. No, not Burgett. She lived on for many years laying her brown eggs. You said all of them disappeared. I made a mistake, my grandmother said. I'm getting old. I can't remember everything. What happened to the fourth child, I asked. The fourth was a boy called Harold, my grandmother said. One morning his skin went all grayish yellow. Then it became hard and crackly like the shell of a nut. By evening, the boy had turned to stone. Stone, I said. You mean real stone? Granite, she said. I'll take you to see him if you like. They still keep him in the, in the house. He stands in the hall, a little stone statue. Visitors lean their, el their umbrellas up against him. Although I was very young, I was not prepared to believe everything my grandmother told me. And yet she spoke with such conviction, with such utter seriousness, and with never a smile on her face or a twinkle in her eye that I found myself beginning to wonder. Go on, Grandmama, I said. You told me there were five altogether. What happened to the last one? Would you like a puff of my cigar? She said. I'm only seven, Grandmama. I don't care what age you are, she said. You'll never catch a cold if you smoke cigars. What about number five, Grandmama? Number five? she said, chewing the end of her cigar as though it were a delicious asparagus, was rather an interesting case. A nine-year-old boy called Leif was summer holidaying 
with his family on the fjord. And the whole family was picnicking and swimming off some rocks on one of those little islands. Young Leif dived into the water, and his father, who was watching him, noticed that he stayed under for an unusually long time. When he came to the surface at last, he wasn't Leif anymore. What was he, Grandmama? He was a porpoise. He wasn't. He couldn't have been. He was a lovely young porpoise, he said, and as friendly as could be. Grandmama, I said, yes, my darling. Did he really and truly turn into a porpoise? Absolutely, she said. I knew his mother well. She told me all about it. She told me how Leif the porpoise stayed with them all that afternoon, giving his brothers and sisters rides on his back. They had a wonderful time. Then he waved a flipper at them and swam away, never to be seen again. But Grandmama, I said, how did they know that the porpoise was actually Leif? He talked to them, my grandmother said. He laughed and joked with them all the time he was giving them rides. But wasn't there a most tremendous fuss when this happened? I asked. Not much, my grandmother said. You must remember that here in Norway, we are used to that sort of thing. There are witches everywhere. There's probably one living in our street this very moment. It's time you went to bed. A witch wouldn't come in through my window in the night, would she? I asked, quaking a little. No, my grandmother said. A witch will never do silly things like climbing up drain pipes or breaking into people's houses. You'll be quite safe in your bed. Come along, I'll tuck you in. <laughs> How to Recognize a Witch The next evening, after my grandmother had given me my bath, she took me once again into the living room for another story. Tonight, the old woman said, I'm going to tell you how to recognize a witch when you see one. Can you always be sure? Asked, I asked. No, she said, you can't. And that's the trouble. But you can make a pretty good guess. She was dropping cigar ash all over her lap, and I hoped she wasn't going to catch on fire before she told me how to recognize a witch. In the first place, she said, a real witch is certain always to be wearing gloves when you meet her. Surely not always, I said. What about in the summer when it's hot? Even in the summer, my grandmother said. She has to. Do you want to know why? Why, I said. Because she doesn't have fingernails. Instead of fingernails, she has thin, curvy claws like a cat and she wears the gloves to hide them. Mind you, lots of very respectable women wear gloves, especially in winter. So this doesn't, make you, doesn't help you very much. Mama used to wear gloves, I said. Not in the house, my grandmother said. Witches wear gloves even in the house. They only take them off when, they're, when they go to bed. How do you know all this, Grandmama? Don't interrupt, she said. Just take it all in. The second thing to remember is that a real witch is always bald. Bald? I said. Bald as a boiled egg, my grandmother said. I was shocked. There was something indecent about a bald woman. Why are they bald, Grandmama? Don't ask me why, she snapped but you can take it from me that not a single hair grows on a witch's head. How horrid! Disgusting, my grandmother said. If she's bald, she'll be easy to spot, I said. Not at all, my grandmother said. A real witch always wears a wig to hide her baldness. She wears a first-class wig and it is almost impossible to tell a real first-class wig from ordinary hair, unless you give it a pull to see if it comes off. Then that's what I'll have to do, I said. Don't be foolish, my grandmother said. You can't go around pulling at the hair of every lady you meet. 
even if she is wearing gloves, just you try it and see what happens. So that doesn't help much either, I said. None of these things is any good on its own, my grandmother said. It's only when you put them all together that they begin to make a little sense. Mind you, my grandmother went on, these wigs do cause a rather serious problem for witches. What problem, Grandmama? They make the scalp itch most terribly, she said. You see, when an actress wears a wig, or if you or I were to wear a wig, we would be putting it on over our own hair. But a witch has to put it straight onto her naked scalp, and the underneath of a wig is always very rough and scratchy. It sets up a frightful itch on the bald skin. It causes nasty sores on the head, wig rash, the witches call it, and it doesn't half itch. What other things must I look for to recognize a witch, I asked. Look for the nose holes, my grandmother said. Witches have slightly larger nose holes than ordinary people. The rim of each nose hole is pink and curvy, like the rim of a certain kind of seashell. Why do they have such big no nose holes, I asked. For smelling with, my grandmother said, a real witch has the most amazing powers of smell. She can actually smell out a child who is standing on the other side of the street on a pitch black night. She couldn't smell me, I said. I've just had a bath. Oh, yes, she could, my grandmother said. The cleaner you happen to be, the more smelly you are to a witch. That can't be true, I said. An absolutely clean child gives off the most ghastly stench to a witch, my grandmother said. The dirtier you are, the less you smell. But that doesn't make sense, Grandmama. Oh, yes, it does, my grandmother said. It isn't the dirt that the witch is smelling. It is you. The smell that drives a witch mad actually comes right out of your own skin. It comes oozing out of your skin in waves. And these waves, stink waves, the witches call them, go floating through the air and hit the witch right smack in her nostrils. They send her reeling. Now wait a minute, Grandmama. Don't interrupt she said. The point is this. When you haven't washed for a week and your skin is all covered over with dirt, then quite obviously the stink waves cannot come oozing out nearly as so strongly. I shall never have a bath again, I said. Just don't have one too often, my grandmother said. Once a month is quite enough for a sensible child. It was at moments like these that I loved my grandmother more than ever. Grandmama, I said, if it's a dark night, how can a witch smell the difference between a child and a grown-up? Because grown-ups don't give out stink waves, she said. Only children do that. But I don't really give out stink waves, do I? I said. I'm not giving them out at this very moment, am I? Not to me, you aren't, my grandmother said. To me, you're smelling like raspberries and cream. But to a witch, you would be smelling absolutely disgusting. What would I be smelling of? I asked. Dog's droppings, my grandmother said. I reeled. I was stunned. Dog's droppings? I cried. I am not smelling of dog's droppings. I don't believe it. I won't believe it. What's more, my grandmother said, speaking with a touch of relish, to a witch you'd be smelling of fresh dog's droppings. That's simply not true, I cried. I know I'm not smelling of dog's droppings, stale or fresh. There's no point in arguing about it, my grandmother said. It's a fact of life. I was outraged. I simply couldn't bring myself to believe what my grandmother was telling me. So if you see a woman holding her nose as she passes you in the street, she went on. That woman could easily be a witch. 
I decided to change the subject. Tell me what else to look for in a witch, I said. The eyes, my grandmother said. Look carefully at the eyes, because the eyes of a real witch are different from yours and mine. Look in the middle of each eye, where there is normally a little black dot. If she is a witch, the black dot will keep changing color, and you will see fire, and you will see ice dancing right in the very center and of the colored dot. It will send shivers running all over your skin. My grandmother leaned back in her chair and sucked away contently at her foul black cigar. I squatted on the floor, staring up at her, fascinated. She was not smiling. She looked deadly serious. Are there other things? I asked her. Of course there are other things, my grandmother said. You don't seem to understand that witches are not actually women at all. They look like women. They talk like women, and they are able to act like women. But in actual fact, they are totally different animals. They are demons in human shape. That is why they have claws and bald heads and queer noses and peculiar eyes all of which they have to conceal as best they can from the rest of the world. What else is different about them, Grandmama? The feet, she said. Witches never have toes. No toes, I cried. Then what do they have? They just have feet, my grandmother said. The feet have square ends with no toes on them at all. Does that make it difficult to walk? I asked. Not at all, my grandmother said, but it does give them a problem with their shoes. All ladies like to wear small, rather pointed shoes, but a witch whose feet are very wide and square at the ends has the most awful job squeezing her feet into those neat little pointed shoes. Why doesn't she wear co wide comfy shoes with square ends? I asked. She dare not, my grandmother said. Just as she hides her baldness with a wig, she must also hide her ugly witch's feet by squeezing them into pretty shoes. Isn't that terribly uncomfortable, I said. Extremely uncomfortable, my grandmother said. But she has to put up with it. If she's wearing ordinary shoes, it won't help me to recognize her. Will it, Grandmama? I'm afraid it won't, my grandmother said. You might possibly see her limping very slightly, but only if you were watching closely. Are those the only differences then, Grandmama? There's one more, my grandmother said, just one more. What is it, Grandmama? Their spit is blue. Blue? I cried. Not blue. Their spit can't be blue. Blue as a bilberry, she said. You don't mean it, Grandmama. Nobody can have blue spit. Witches can, she said. Is it like ink, I asked. Exactly, she said. They even use it to write with. They use these old-fashioned pens that have nibs, and they simply lick the nib. Can you notice the blue spit, Grandmama? If a witch was talking to me, would I be able to notice it? Only if you looked carefully, my grandmother said. If you looked very carefully, you would probably see a slight bluish tinge on their teeth, but it doesn't show much. It would if she spat, I said. Witches never spit, my grandmother said. They daren't. I, could be I couldn't believe my grandmother would be lying to me. She went to church every morning of the week, and she said grace before every meal. And somebody, somebody who did that would never tell lies. I was beginning to believe every word she spoke. So there you are, my grandmother said. That's about all I can tell you. None of it is very helpful. You can still never be absolutely sure whether a woman is a witch or not, just by looking at her. But if she is wearing the gloves, 
if she has the large nose holes, the queer eyes, and the hair that looks as though it might be a wig, and if she has a bluish tinge on her teeth, if she has all of these things, then you run like mad. Grandmama, I said, when you were a little girl, did you ever meet a witch? Once, my grandmother said, only once. What happened? I'm not going to tell you, she said. It would frighten you out of your skin and give you bad dreams. Please tell me, I begged. No, she said. Certain things are too horrible to talk about. Does it have something to do with your missing thumb? I asked. Suddenly, her old wrinkled lips shut tight as a pair of tongs on the hand that held the cigar, which had no thumb on it, began to quiver very slightly. I waited. She didn't look at me. She didn't speak. All of a sudden, she had shut herself off completely. The conversation was finished. Good night, Grandmama, I said, rising from the floor and kissing her on the cheek. She didn't move. I crept out of the room and went to my bed, bedroom. The Grand High Witch The next day, a man in a black suit arrived at the house carrying a briefcase, and he held a long conversation with my grandmother in the living room. I was not allowed in while he was there. But when at last he went away, my grandmother came in to me, walking very slowly and looking very sad. That man was reading me your father's will, she said. What is a will? I asked her. It is something you write before you die, she said. And in it, you say who is going to have your money and your property. But most important of all, it says who is going to look after your child if both the mother and father are dead. A fearful panic took hold of me. It didn't say you, Grandmama, I cried. I don't have to go to somebody else, do I? No, she said. Your father would never have done that. He has asked me to care for, of you for as long as I live. But he has also asked that I take you back to your own house in England. He wants us to stay there. But why? I said, why can't we stay here in Norway? You would hate to live anywhere else. You told me you would. I know, she said, but there are a lot of complications with money and with the house that you wouldn't understand. Also, it said in the will that although all your families are region, you were born in England and you have started your education there and he wants you to continue going to English schools. Oh, Grandmama, I cried. You don't want to go and live in our English house. I know you don't. Of course I don't, she said, but I'm afraid I must. The will said that your mother felt the same way about it, and it is important to respect the wishes of the parents. There was no way out of it. We had to go to England, and my grandmother started making arrangements at once. Your next school term begins in a few days, she said, so we don't have any time to waste. On the evening before we left for England, my grandmother got on to her favorite subject once again. There are not as many witches in England as there are in Norway, she said. I'm sure I won't meet one, I said. I sincerely hope you won't, she said, because those English witches are probably the most vicious in the whole world. She sat there smoking her foul cigar and talking away. I kept looking at the hand with the missing thumb. I couldn't help it. I was fascinated by it, and I kept wondering what awful thing had happened that time when she had met a witch. It must have been something absolutely appalling and gruesome. Otherwise, she would have told me about it. Maybe the thumb had been twisted off, or perhaps... She had been forced to jam her thumb down the spout of a boiling kettle until it was steamed away. Or did someone pull it out of her hand like a tooth? I couldn't help trying to guess. 
Tell me what those English wishes, witches do, Grandmama, I said. Well, she said, sucking away at her stinking cigar. Their favorite ruse is to mix up a powder that will turn a child into some creature or other that all grown-ups hate. What sort of creature, Grandmama? Often it's a slug, she said. A slug is one of their favorites. Then the grown-ups step on the slug and squish it without knowing it's a child. That's perfectly beastly, I cried. Or it might be a flea, my grandmother said. They might turn you into a flea, and without realizing what she was doing, your own mother would get out the flea powder, and then it's goodbye you. You're making me nervous, Grandmama. I don't think I want to go back to England. I've known English witches, she went on, who have turned children into pheasants and then sneaked the pheasants up into the woods the very day before the pheasant shooting season opened. Ouch, I said. So they got shot? Of course they got shot, she said. And they get plucked and roasted and eaten for supper. I pictured myself as a pheasant flying frantically over the men with guns, swerving and dipping as the guns exploded below me. Yes, my grandmother said, it gives the English witches great pleasure to stand back and watch the grown-ups doing away with their own children. I really don't want to go to England, Grandmama. Of course you don't, she said, nor do I, but I'm afraid we've got to. Are witches completely, are witches different in every country, I asked? Completely different, my grandmother said but I don't know much about the other countries. Don't you even know about America? I asked. Not really, she answered. Although I have heard it said that over there the witches are able to make the grown-ups eat their own children. Never, I cried. Oh no, Grandmama, that couldn't be true. I don't know whether it's true or not, she said. It's only a rumor I've heard. But how could they possibly make them eat their own children, I asked. By turning them into hot dogs, she said. That wouldn't be too difficult for a clever witch. Does every single country in the world have its witches, I asked. Wherever you find people, you find witches, my grandmother said. There is a secret society of witches in every country. And do they all know one another, Grandmama? They do not she said. A witch only knows the witches in her own country. She is strictly forbidden to communicate with any foreign witches. But an English witch, for example, will know all other witches in England. They're all friends. They ring each other up. They swap deadly recipes. Goodness knows what else they talk about. I hate to think. I sat on the floor watching my grandmother. She put her cigar stub in the ashtray and folded her hands across her stomach. Once a year, she went on, the witches of each separate country hold their own secret meeting. They all get together in one place to receive a lecture from the Grand High Witch of all the world. From who? I cried. She is the ruler of them all, my grandmother said. She is all-powerful. She is without mercy. All other witches are petrified of her. They see her only once a year at their annual meeting. She goes there to whip up excitement and enthusiasm and to give orders. The Grand High Witch travels from country to country, attending these annual meetings. Where do they have these meetings, Grandmama? They are all sorts of rumors, my grandmother answered. I have heard it said that they just book into a hotel like any other group of women who are holding a meeting. I have also heard it said that some very peculiar things go on in the hotels they stay in. It is rumored that the beds are never slept in, that there are burn marks on the bedroom carpets, that toads are discovered in the bathtubs, and that down in the kitchen the cook once found a baby crocodile swimming in his saucepan of soup. My grandmother picked up her cigar and took another puff, 
inhaling the foul smoke deeply into her lungs. Where does the Grand High Witch live when she's not at home? I asked. Nobody knows, my grandmother said. If we knew that, then she could be rooted out and destroyed. Witchophiles all over the world have spent their lives trying to discover the secret headquarters of the Grand High Witch. What's a witchophile, Grandmama? A person who studies witches and knows a lot about them, my grandmother said. Are you a witchophile, Grandmama? I am a retired witchophile, she said. I am too old to be active any longer. But when I was younger, I traveled all over the globe trying to track down the Grand High Witch. I never came even close to succeeding. Is she rich? I asked. She's rolling, my grandmother said, simply rolling in money. Rumor has it that there is a machine in her headquarters, which is exactly like the machine the government uses to print the banknotes that you and I use. After all, banknotes are only bits of paper with special designs and pictures on them. Anyone can make them who has the right machine and the right paper. My guess is that the Grand High Witch makes all the money she wants and dishes it out to witches everywhere. What about foreign money? I asked. Those machines can make Chinese money if you want them to, my grandmother said. It's only a question of pressing the right button. But Grandmama, I said, if nobody has ever seen the Grand High Witch, how can you be so sure she exists? My grandmother gave me a long and very severe look. Nobody has ever seen the devil, she said, but we know he exists. The next morning we sailed for England, and soon I was back in the old family house in Kent but this time with only my grandmother to look after me. Then the Easter term began, and every weekday I went to school and everything seemed to have come back to normal again. Now at the bottom of our garden, there was an enormous conker tree. High up in its branches, Timmy, my best friend, and I had started to build a magnificent treehouse. We were able to work on it only at the weekend but we were getting all along fine. We had begun with the floor, which we built by laying wide planks between two part, two quite far apart branches and nailing them down. Within a month, we had finished the floor. Then we constructed a wood railing around the floor, but that left only the roof to be built. The roof was the difficult bit. One Saturday afternoon, when Timmy was in bed with flu, I decided to, to make a start on the roof all by myself. It was lovely being high up there in the conker tree, all alone with the pale young leaves coming out everywhere around me. It was like being in a big green cave, and the height made it extra exciting. My grandmother had told me that if I fell, I would break a leg and every time I looked down, I got a tingle along my spine. I worked away, nailing the first plank on the roof. Then suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of a woman standing immediately below me. She was looking up at me and smiling in the most peculiar way. When most people smile, their lips go out sideways. This woman's lips went upwards and downwards showing all her front teeth and gums. The gums were like raw meat. It is always a shock to discover that you are being watched when you think you are alone. And what was this strange woman doing in her garden anyway? I noticed that she was wearing a small black hat, and she had black gloves on her hands, and the gloves came nearly up to her elbows. Gloves! She was wearing gloves! rose all over. I have a present for you, she said, still staring at me, still smiling, still showing her teeth and gums. I didn't answer. Come down out of that tree, little boy, she said, and I shall give you the most exciting present you've ever had. Her voice had a curious rasping quality. It made a sort of metallic sound as though 
Her throat was full of drawing pins. Without taking her eyes, without taking her eyes from my face, she very slowly put one of her, those gloved hands into her purse and drew out a small green snake. She held it up for me to see. It's tame, she said. The snake began to coil itself around her forearm. It was brilliant green. If you come down here, I shall give him to you, she said. Oh, Grandmama, I thought, come and help me. Then I panicked. I dropped the hammer and shot up that enormous tree like a monkey. I didn't stop until I was as high as I could possibly go. And there I stayed, quivering with fear. I couldn't see the woman now. There were layers and layers of leaves between her and me. I stayed up there for hours, and I kept very still. It began to grow dark. At last, I heard my grandmother calling my name. I'm up here, I shouted back. Come down at once, she called out. It's past your supper time. Grandmama, I shouted. Has that woman gone? What woman? My grandmother called back. The woman in the black gloves. There was a silence from below. It was the silence of somebody who was too stunned to speak. Grandmama, I shouted again. Has she gone? Yes, my grandmother answered at last. She's gone. I'm here, my darling. I'll look after you. You can come down now. I climbed down. I was trembling. My grandmother enfolded me in her arms. I've seen a witch, I said. Come inside, she said. You'll be all right with me. She led me into the house and gave me a cup of hot cocoa with lots of sugar in it. Tell me everything, she said. I told her. By the time I had finished, it was my grandmother who was trembling. Her face was ashy gray, and I saw her glance down at that hand of hers that didn't have a thumb. You know what this means, she said. It means that there is one of them in our district. From now on, I'm not letting you walk alone to school. Do you think she could be after me specially? I asked. No, she said. I doubt that. One child is as good as uh, any other to uh, those creatures. It is hardly surprising that after that I became a very witch-conscious little boy. If I happened to be alone on the road and saw a woman approaching who was wearing gloves, I would quickly skip across to the other side. And as the weather remained pretty cold during the whole of that month, nearly everybody was wearing gloves. Curiously enough, though, I never saw the woman with the green snake again. That was my first witch, but it wasn't my last.